Hello everyone, welcome back again to this online uh, Structural Geology NPTEL course. Uh, we are uh, going to start a new week and we are in our lecture number 24. As I said in the last lecture that we will we'll continue with the superposed, uh, not folding, but superposed deformation. So, in structural geology there are some uh, typical uh, microstructures that help us to figure out the different stages of deformation. So, I thought that before we go to the actual topic of this week, which is Budinaj, we talk a little bit about uh, this particular uh, microstructural features, which we will cover in this lecture today and this is on porphyroblasts. So, the aim of this lecture is uh, basically uh, to understand the metamorphic mineral growth prior, during and after deformation. Now, this is something very uh, important for us to understand at this time that structural geology, it is not a standalone subject in the sense that deformation most of the cases, particularly in the ductile domain do happen with the metamorphism of rocks. So, rocks experience high pressure and temperature they undergo a lot of phase transformations, they develop different fabrics due to deformation and these fabrics also do control some sort of metamorphic reactions as well. So, if we try to study structural geology separately without considering the processes of metamorphism, it would be a good idea. So, this lecture in a way would give you a visualization or an impression that how metamorphism or metamorphic petrology is closely related to structural geology. So, this is why we learn the metamorphic mineral growths that do develop before, during and after deformation. So, there are two common terminologies that we use, one is porphyroclasts and another is porphyroblasts. Now, in general both porphyroclasts and porphyroblasts, they are both relatively larger crystals within a finer grained matrix or the host rocks. So, porphyroclasts when it starts with C that means clasts is gen, are, are generally large grains that remained large while their surrounding matrix became fine grained. Classes or this, this word clasts came from this word particularly classes and classes means breaking, we will see some examples soon. On the other hand porphyroblasts, so the new grown metamorphic minerals that grow over pre-existing minerals. So, this is the new mineral, these are reaction products during metamorphism. So, blasis means growing. So, porphyroclasts are old larger grains and porphyroblasts are new larger grains. Now, why this is important to study porphyroblast, this is actually the uh, topic we are going to learn today. So, porphyroblasts mostly contain information on tectonic and metamorphic evolution. Now, there are series of inclusion patterns within the porphyroblasts that record the microstructures of the rock during their growth and therefore, they are very, very useful in reconstructing the deformation history and to some extent the history of the metamorphism as well. Porphyroblasts you can also use uh, to study the different kinematic behaviors or kinematic significance of their rotation and non-rotation with uh, respect to a specific reference frames. This we will learn in our shear zone lecture and there we will see that how you can use the rotation of porphyroblasts in figuring out the uh, kinematics. So, whether we, which sense the shear zone moved with respect to a fixed reference frame, we will learn it in the shear zone lecture. But in this lecture, we will mostly focus on this point 2 and we will see that how porphyroblasts are useful, the information that is that it contains within itself to figure out the when they have grown and therefore, we can figure out the deformation history. So, here are a uh, few examples of porphyroclasts and porphyroblasts as you can see in the right panel, we have examples of porphyroclasts. So, these are blasts and these are we will see it soon blasts. Of course, you have to add the prefix porphyro. Now, what we see in the first image, we, we see uh, 
this this matrix is as you can see it's fine grained you can also figure out that there is a foliation going on almost east to west in this in this image but there are few larger grains for example this one or this one now these are not new grains these are some old grains which did not participate in the deformation process but it may participate or it could participate if the deformation would continue but it did not happen so it stayed like this probably because these are the stronger minerals or didn't have enough uh, reaction kinetics to develop new grains or to fragment for not having enough stress so this is a field photograph as you can see from this scale and this is a optical microscope image so a thin section and here again you see that we have this yellow grain here and this is a porphyroclasts and you see the grain also got fractured and developed a slip along this so these are examples of porphyroclasts you also see that grain was before this is why the foliation got wrapped around this porphyroclast now in the other side we have examples of porphyroblasts what do we see here this is again a foliated rock you can see the foliation is overall going like this little bit undulated foliation but it is a continuous foliation and what do you see here there are again some large grains these grains are garnet and these garnets they grew during the deformation during the metamorphism so the host rock is mostly mica schists and then at high pressure temperature due to reactions the garnet grains grew and these garnet grains contain a lot of information or they inherit lot of information during their growth so again this is a field photograph the second one is an optical image and there you see that this garnet grain again this is a garnet grain is a plain polarized light and you see that this garnet has many many inclusions in it so these inclusions are studied for series of petrochemical and geochemical information but at the same time you can also study this to figure out the deformation histories and so on and this is the aim of this lecture we will learn this soon porphyroblasts these are mostly wise, widespread in rocks uh, that have been at upper green schist or higher metamorphic facies that means you have to have enough pressure and temperature to make these minerals react and produce new grains now in common metapilitic uh, rocks you find the porphyroblasts like uh, chlorite chloritoid biotite garnet cordiorite sillimanite kyanite andalusite and staurolite so these are all uh, metamorphic minerals and they are considered as porphyroblasts if the source rock is metapalitic by composition if they are metabasites that means the source rock is a basic rock then the porphyroblasts or typical porphyroblast minerals uh, one can form are garnet plagioclase epidote and hornblende and and there are few other minerals so if you see this kind of minerals in your thin sections you can actually figure out that these are porphyroblasts they have grown during deformation and then you can look for if they are containing some information within it and most of the cases i repeat we study them under microscope so <clears throat> there are three uh, classifications of porphyroblasts one is poikiloblast another is xenoblast and the third one is idioblast so a poikiloblast is when a porphyroblast contains high concentration of inclusions so for example this is an acm image you see this is again a garnet the matrix is very fine grain and then you see a few garnet grains here here and here and these garnet grains have lot of inclusions within it so these are known as poikiloblast now a porphyroblast with a shape that is not controlled by its crystallographic features known as xenoblast for example again we are looking at a porphyroblast that has grown and you see that it has lot of finer grains outside you can also figure out a foliation here 
but this crystal which you see inside it really does not have any uh, crystallographic features within it. So, we will call it xenoblast. On the other hand, if a porphyroblast that has uh, that appears to us with some sort of crystallographic features within it, then these are known as idioblast. For example, again in this image you can see that you have a fine grain matrix with the foliation and within this foliation you have porphyroblasts which are showing very straight edges and therefore, they are their growth or their presence in this thin section some sort of a their growth were controlled by uh, their crystallographic features and these are known as idioblast. Now, porphyroblasts you do not form in a monomineralic rock you need to have a polycrystalline rock to develop the porphyroblasts and this is simply because you need uh, two different minerals so that they can react to each other or two different phases to react each other and produce a new mineral which would be the porphyroblasts. Now, small grains have relatively high free surface energy and therefore, less stable than larger grains. So, how do they grow porphyroblasts? So, this problem is generally solved at specific sites controlled by small irregularities such as strongly deformed grains or micro fractures. So, these are the sites where it controls the uh, free surface energy and so on and therefore, grains can grow bigger and bigger. Now, the crystals they can grow by solid state diffusion. So, diffusion mechanism in, in solid state matter through or it can develop some sort of fluid phases through fluid phases that can present along the grain boundaries and these fluid phases can help in growing this porphyroblasts or minerals and these things you may have learned from your metamorphic lecture. So, I am not going into the details. Now, during their growth if the diffusion rate is extremely high then you do not have any reaction product remaining in your material. So, therefore, the porphyroblasts do not contain any inclusions or any sorts of features of the previous stages of deformation or its own host rock. And in that case, if it is free of any inclusions and things like that, then you get a gemstone. But if the diffusion rate is extremely low, then the porphyroblasts they overgrow and include the reaction products, and these are known as passive inclusions. We will mostly look for this. So, gemstones, yes, they are useful, but for structural interpretations, gemstones are not that useful. Now, if you have many nuclei, then you will form small porphyroblasts. So, if the nucleation sites in the rock are many, then you do not grow large porphyroblasts. So, porphyroblasts would be also many in numbers, but they are of less size. But if there are few nuclei, then you grow large porphyroblasts as it is explained here and for small porphyroblasts we have explained in the diagram on the left side. Now, this is a fantastic image showing the use of porphyroblasts or why this is important. What do we see in this image that these are garnet grains. Let me consider this one. These are also garnets is a field photograph. And then in the matrix we have mostly homogeneous features. We also do not see a a strong foliation and so on, but you may figure out there might be a foliation going like this, but that is not very, very strong foliation. However, if we look now inside the garnet grains, we see that it contains an excellent fabric. So, this fabric must be the fabric which was present also in the matrix at one point of time. Now, these garnets when they grew they tracked this fabric and then the deformation stopped for a while or it continued, but the garnets because they are very strong in the later stages of deformation the fabrics inside the garnet is still there, but the outside the host rock or the country rock does not contain any 
fabric similar to this. So, these new fabrics have come in the picture and they completely destroyed the older fabrics. So, this tells us that this garnet or this rock has suffered at least two stages of deformation. The first deformation tracks this fabric inside and second deformation that washed out the fabrics outside. Now, of course, it may have few other deformations, but from this picture, we at least can interpret that this rock has undergone two stages of deformation. Now, in the following slides, what I am going to show you that development of this kind of features and so on. And the photographs, I will use the micro photographs, these are mostly uh, derived or mostly adopted from a book called Micro Tectonics written by Pashkier and Trau. Uh, so, for this particular topic, I would re I'd refer uh, that, that, that book of Pashkier and Trau, Micro Tectonics, that explained the features of porphyroblasts in a very nice way. So, what we see here in this image, we, we are going to see that how this porphyroblast successively develop. So, we can imagine that all these uh, straight lines here, these are as we have learnt in the previous lectures that these could be considered as continuous foliation and we can assign them as our S1 that means foliation or cystosity that developed at the first deformation. Now, we will see what we can do with this foliation which is S1 foliation and that has formed in the stage of deformation D1. Now, this foliation can get further deformed this S1 and can produce a crenulation cleavage which now is oriented like this and we can assign them as S2 whether this one was S1. So, S1 got crenulated to develop S2 and this is crenulation cleavage because this is the cleavage domain and these are the microlithon domains and microlithon domains here at least in this illustration contains a fabric. So, this is why this is crenulation cleavage. Now, at this stage what can happen that a reaction can go on and the rock can produce a metamorphic mineral. For example, in this case this yellow grain. Now, when this yellow grain has grown, it tracks the crenulation cleavage within it. As you can see here, it has the foliation not necessarily as continuous as it was outside, but it has the foliation within it, which is mimicking also the foliation outside. Now, this mineral grain, this yellow mineral grain can track or can host this foliation for a quite a long time and can protect this foliation while this outside can be deformed further and which we are going to see in the next slide. What do you see here? This crenulation cleavage outside is now completely washed out because of a third stage of deformation. So, what we have developed here, this is the traces of S3 and there is no trace of S1 and S2. So, just looking at if I do not have this mineral grain here, this porphyroblast here, I probably could not figure out that there were at least two stages of deformation and this rock had S1 and S2 foliation within it. Now, how do I know this? Yes, this mineral is going to give me the clue. What we see within this mineral that it had a fabric and that fabric got folded. So, you must have a deformation to produce this first fabric which was your S1 and then you have the second fabric that was the S2 and these two fabrics were also present in the matrix, but the matrix could not protect them due to the third stage of deformation, but because they were already included in this mineral grain, they could protect it. So, we see that this rock at least suffered three stages of deformation and this we can only know because we have a porphyroblast that has grown during the third stage of deformation or between second and third stage of deformation. So, these 
are therefore are very, very important. If you see them in your thin section, then it is very important you try to figure out if it is containing some information or not. Now, these porphyroblasts can grow before, during and after the deformation. So, based on that we classify the porphyroblasts and we will learn it in the next slide, but before that let us have a look that how we can sort of figure out that what are the different parts that we need to look at to understand the porphyroblasts. So, in this illustration what we see that this is the porphyroblasts, this, this yellow grain and these porphyroblast contains a fabric which is going or which is being shown by these dotted lines. And these we will refer as internal foliation or SI. Now, whatever stays outside we will refer it as external foliation or SE. Now, within this SE we can have cleavage domain, we can have microlithon and so on, we will not go into that. And because we have a rigid porphyroblast, then we can also expect some sort of areas around this porphyroblast, which on the both side it can be symmetric or asymmetric or in different shapes, we will learn it later and these are known as strain shadow. And at the top and bottom of this porphyroblast in particular, the foliations are somehow wrapped or they are squeezed together and these are known as strain cap as you can see here. So, these are the basic anatomy of a porphyroblast related features and now we will see the classification of porphyroblasts. As I said that we can have three basic types of porphyroblasts, one is pre-tectonic, another is syntectonic and the third one is post-tectonic. The pre-tectonic porphyroblasts as the name suggests pre that means they were before the deformation or prior the deformation, seen means during the deformation and post means after the deformation. So, the classification is very straightforward and simple. Porphyroblasts, if you grow before the deformation, then it is pretectonic. If the porphyroblasts are growing during the deformation, it is syntectonic and when the deformation ceased and then you have developed the porphyroblast, then it is post-tectonic porphyroblasts. Now, there is another category which is known as intertectonic porphyroblasts. So, this is another possibility where there or where the porphyroblasts grow in between two deformation phases. So, one deformation has happened, then a porphyroblast has grown, then a second deformation came. So, that is also possibility which is known as intertectonic. We are not going to learn this intertectonic porphyroblast in this lecture uh, particularly, but if you are further interested to go ahead with this topic, you certainly can consult the book of Paschkir and Trau, Microtectonics. So, let us have a look of this uh, three uh, classifications that we have uh, just learned. So, first we will take over the pre-tectonic porphyroblasts. Now, as we said that pre-tectonic porphyroblasts, they grow before the development of tectonic fabrics. So, the porphyroblasts you can imagine that they are actually with respect to the deformation, they can behave as porphyroclasts because they, they actually appear as or they, pre, they are present in the system as old grains. Now, if the porphyroblasts can have some sort of fabrics within that, so the inclusion pattern would be random or there, there should be no foliation, so in indicating that there is no foliation at the time of blastosis. And the younger foliation also because the inclusions you have already there, the, the porphyroblasts you have already in your system, so younger foliations may wrap over this. So, as you can see here, you may have some sort of random foliation within this which does not make any sense just because it is not connecting with the foliation outside. So, you may have or you may not have SI in, so internal foliations within the blasts, but interestingly you can see that the foliations as you can see here, these are wrapping around. So, that means that porphyroblast you had 
since the beginning of the deformation. Now, syntectonic porphyroblasts, these are very interesting uh, porphyroblasts that we study a lot. So, they grow during the deformation or during the development of the tectonic fabrics. Now, inclusion trails or outside foliation or inside foliation in a way S E and S I, they are continuous. As I can see here, this I can consider as S I and outside I can consider as S E. So, you see here in this schematic illustration, the S I and S E, they are continuous. Inclusion pattern and outside foliations are very similar and this can also happen. You see that these are going more or less in a very similar way. The gradual transition of pattern and orientation of inclusion trails from core to rim of porphyroblasts. So, for example, you can see here that there is here the fabric is oriented like this, then like this, then like this and then like this and here as well. So, there is a gradual transition from the core to the rim and then to the matrix. So, this transition also indicates that this is a syntectonic porphyroblast. Now, orientation of the inclusion trails in the core of porphyroblast may have different orientation due to the rotation. This is exactly what we are talking about and we will learn it soon that if this is rotating this way, then it was actually initially straight, but then it, it has been rotating. So, therefore, you do not see them aligned as the foliation outside. And these are typically known as snowball garnets because garnets generally show this kind of structures, but there are other minerals that also produce this kind of features. And you also should have a possible deflection of uh, foliations outside like you see that it got deflected outside like this and like this and so on and here on and here on. So, these are the typical features of syntectonic porphyroblasts. Now, post tectonic porphyroblasts on the other hand that do grow after the tectonic deformation and fabric development. So, what we see here the inclusion trails outside and inside or S i and S e are exactly similar. So, it just continued like this, but this is also a condition we imposed for syntectonic porphyroblasts. But in syntectonic porphyroblasts, this internal foliation or S i has the very similar trend of S e. So, it, it is not rotated or something like that within the uh, S i. So, therefore, this is an example of post tectonic porphyroblast. And you also would not see any deflection of foliation because deformation is over, deformation is switched off. So, these new minerals are just growing over it. So, you do not see any deflection of foliation outside this. So, they would be extremely straight away entering to the inclusions or porphyroblasts. Now, there are some examples that, that uh, tells you that yes, these are porphyroblasts and these are pre tectonic porphyroblasts. Now, you can imagine if I have a pre tectonic porphyroblast. So, the porphyroblasts also suffered the deformation. Now, based on the composition, based on the mineral and based on the orientation of the minerals with respect to the overall deformation axis and so on, it can produce a series of microstructures which are extremely useful to identify whether they are pre-tectonic or not. And these include bend crystals with undulose extinctions, the foliation can wrap around a porphyroblast pressure shadow or fringe, kink bands or some sort of folds. If you have phyllosilicates or tabular minerals in, in, in your in tabular porphyroblast in the rock, you can have micro budinage, the grains can fracture as you can see here example E and of course, you can have deformation twins or deformation lamella. We will see this in the next example. For example, you see here, this is a competent lens. And you see the foliation outside wrapped around this, right. So, this must be a pre tectonic clast, ok. Now, it can be a porphyroclast as well, but in this case, we can consider for our understanding that this could be a 
pre-tectonic porphyroblast. Now, here there are series of examples as you can see here these are all pre-tectonic porphyroblasts, but they can be also porphyroclasts, but the mechanism is very similar. The first image you see that the trails, so probably this was the grain and because it was deforming compression was from this in this side you develop the foliation here nicely and you see this grains are stretched. So, this is indicating that this is a porphyroblast. Also you can see that the foliation are wrapped around this or here you see in a fantastic way. So, these are typical example of pre-tectonic porphyroblasts. This is a GIF image that I collected from Wikipedia and you see the stage is rotating and you see a continuous undulous extinction going on in these quads and you also see that outside the matrix is extremely fine grained and this grain is pretty large. So, this could be a porphyroclast as well, but it is showing an undulous extinction and therefore, this must be there in the rock before the deformation. This is again uh, something that you can see that a large calcite grain with some sort of twin lamellies here and these are the twins. So, this must have grown before the deformation. In a very similar way that we have seen here, this image also shows that this is your porphyroblast which was broken here producing some microbudinage and it also shows this strange shadow in a nice way and we also see that foliations are wrapped around this and there is also no internal fabric SI is absent. So, you do not see any SI within this porphyroblast. The microbudinage you can see the here that two feldspar grains here on this quad mica matrix the foliation goes like this. You see the foliation first of all got wrapped like this here and here and this was a single grain before, but because of the deformation the grain got fractured and therefore, you see them in two different pieces. So, that clearly indicates that this large grain or porphyroblast was there at the beginning of the deformation or before the deformation and therefore, it got broken. You can also see this we have seen this image before in one of the lectures. This is a biotite uh, aggregate of biotite crystals and this is a porphyroblast because it got deformed in a diff and producing a fold whether the matrix is mostly quadrophilspathic rich and it is much more finer grain. So, this is a porphyroblast and because it has a deformation within it, it got folded. So, therefore, it must be in the rock before the deformation. So, this is how you identify the pre-tectonic porphyroblasts from your thin section studies. Now, the syntectonic porphyroblasts, they grow during the deformation as we have already learned and here is a cartoon diagram illustrating how this can happen. So, again this is your foliation. Say for example, I can consider a continuous foliation as S1 and a porphyroblast is growing in this rock. And if this rock is deforming or it is under shear, so that means it is having a sinistral sense of shear. So, this inclusion would rotate and this is how the rotation is being shown, but at the same time the inclusion is also growing. So, the foliation here at this stage is already there. So, it would simply rotate. So, you see that this is not as straight as it is. So, this foliation would rotate, but the outside foliation also is being incorporated within this inclusion. So, this is gradually becoming straight or gradually becoming aligned with the foliation outside. Here you see this is S i and this is S e. So, you see this gradual rotation is happening during the growth and at the same time rotation of this inclusion. And this continued and finally, you see that this is your final porphyroblast and you have the deflection of the foliation, you have rotation of the foliation inside, you have continuity of S i and S e and so on. So, this clearly tells you that this if I have this in my thin section and if I see the features inside the thin section like this, this clearly tells you that 
this is a syntectonic porphyroblast. Not only that, we know that this must be aligned with the foliation before. So, but just looking at this angle, you can also figure out how much rotation the grain has suffered. This is a very simple analysis that you can do, but it could be much complex as well. Now, here are examples of syntectonic porphyroblasts. All photographs are from the book Pasquier and Trau, Microtectonics. And you see here how nicely the foliation you see outside is very much like this, the continuous foliation. These are your porphyroblasts. So, the foliation is going like that and then you see it went in and going like this. So, it is continuous. You can see also here. This is a large grain in the fine grain matrix and you see that this is showing a continuous trail or continuous trend of the foliation and therefore, this is a syntectonic porphyroblast. You can also see this here. So, this is your porphyroblast and this is exactly the example we have seen before. So, this is how your foliation inside the porphyroblast is appearing. So, whenever you see this, you can figure out that this must be syntectonic porphyroblasts. Now, we see examples of post tectonic porphyroblasts. As you can see here, this is a chloride grain here within a fine grained matrix or showing some very fine cleavage. We call it, we can call it slaty cleavage. And you see outside and inside there is absolutely no difference. The foliation is going like this and the crystal is just like a glass is being placed on, on, on that surface. So, there is no deflection of foliation, there is nothing, no difference between S i and S e. So, therefore, this must be a post tectonic porphyroblast. As you can see here, this is a biotite crystal which has overgrown this granulation cleavage. You can see the granulation cleavage is going like this and you see that it did not disturb anything. There is no deflection of the foliation outside. So, foliation is very much straight here, nothing has happened. You also see that this is continuous inside wherever it could track and it did not disturb anything in the matrix, it just grew over it. So, this is again an example of post tectonic porphyroblast. This is another example. <clears throat> so, this is a storolite crystal at the bottom and here you see this is a biotite crystal and the foliation outside goes like this. And here you see that this foliation is being continued through the porphyroblasts without any deflection, without any change of orientation and anything. So, these two, so S i and S e and here as well S i and S e has virtually no difference and therefore, this is again an example of post tectonic porphyroblast. So, with this I finish this lecture. So, this was just a little uh, idea that how you can also figure out uh, superposition of deformation not necessarily from the folds, but from uh, metamorphic textures together with the study of fabric analysis. We can understand how to figure out the different stages of deformation not always by looking at superposed folding but some sort of overprinting relationships. And in the next lecture, we will start the actual topic of this week, which is Buddhinaj. Thank you very much. I will see you in the next lecture.